Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is a very special moment for me. Um, my name is Mashonda Tafrere. I'm the founder of Art Leader, Art Genesis. I'm also a curator, an author, and a singer. So tonight is special because I've been wanting to have this conversation with these two amazing people for a really long time. Um, they're both mentors. They're both really great friends. Um, and amazing collectors in this space. So the talk is on the importance of collecting and preserving black art. The conversation, sorry, will discuss how and why black collectors purchase art and how they imagine the legacy of their collections to impact the world. We will also speak on art preservation and protecting our culture overall. Panelists include mm. Hill Harper, oh, that's me. <laughs> who most of you probably know as an actor, but he's also the founder of the Harper Museum and an amazing collector. Yeah. We have the incredible Lisan Basquiat, who is, I can't even hold it in, who is the co-executor of the estate of Jean-Michel Basquiat, my brother, and the founder of Shaping Freedom, yeah, a nice. brother. Wow. Yeah. wow. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna give them a moment to properly introduce themselves and just share a little bit about their journey. Hi. <laughs> How are y'all doing? This is such a beautiful space, Mashanda. I just have to say, Thank it you. is incredible Thank and you. beautiful, and I love the energy in this room, really. Um, my name is Lisanne Basquiat. I am the middle child of three. My brother Jean-Michel, uh, you all know who my brother Jean-Michel is. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my sister Janine, uh, our brother passed away uh, 34 years ago. And um, while our brother is this incredible phenomenon for pop culture and uh, the just such an incredible energy for people, for people of color, for people you know within pop culture. Period. Um, he was also one of three children and the son of someone, and um, and it has been overwhelmingly beautiful to witness the trajectory of Jean-Michel's life, work, and the ways that people have connected to it and heard him. Because I think there aren't very many things that we want more in the world than to be seen and heard. And uh, he is seen and heard because people like us in this room and um, others over the last 34 years have taken the time and energy to follow this incredible voice expressed through artwork and um, drawings and paintings and you know all the different ways that he expressed. So my role, along with my sister, is to protect the legacy of our brother and to ensure that the world knows that we have his back. Mm. And we are doing that after our dad um, who passed away in 2013, Gerard Basquiat, uh, really jumped in very early on after Jean-Michel passed away to make sure that there was stake in the ground that this black man had family and he had people who loved him and that we valued what Jean-Michel, Jean-Michel's life work and the ways that he create, what he created and the ways that he expressed that. Uh, so, Janine and I today, we work all day, every day, to protect that legacy. And most recently opened, uh, curated, and executive produced uh, the um, Jean-Michel Basquiat King Pleasure exhibition that opened. Mm -hmm. Woo! A project that we are both very, very proud of. And um, uh, if you get a chance, go see it if you're in New York. Uh, and I also founded um, Shaping Freedom, which is a personal growth company uh, focused on helping people to improve the relationship that they're in with themselves so that they can be better parents, better lovers, better colleagues, and all that good stuff. 
talking of it. Yeah. Beautiful. And thank you so much, Rashawn, for inviting me, you know, to have this conversation with you too. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey everybody, I'm Hill. I, this conversation is so important, and, I, and I'm, I'm just excited about it in the, uh, for, for a number of reasons, but not the least of which is I hope this conversation is very similar to the many, many, many conversations Mashana and I have about the importance of us collecting our work and being able to control our narrative as well as being able to control the work itself. And that's what being a collector is, right? Um, it's not being a traitor. It's not being um, uh, someone who sticks their toe in the water. It's being someone who, 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 who collects and understands and supports artists and creatives. And, and we talk about it all the time that other folks are, um, have done a really good job of commoditizing us, our art, and created institutions and wealth and generational wealth off of our creativity. And this conversation hopefully is very similar to the ones we talk about, yeah. about the things that we can do to one, support artists, to make sure that we understand that we have the power to control the ecosystem mm -hmm. and somebody else doesn't. And that, um, and why it's so important that everybody in this room collects our art. Whether it's this art on the walls here or someplace else, and um, so I'm excited about this conversation, You're so thank here. you. Thank you, thank you so much. So, Hill, I'm gonna start with you. I'm on the museum board for the Hill Harbor. Museum My museum Harbor. board, yes. <laughs> Let me just start She's with that. A... <coughs> she um, is. <laughs> and I've acquired, I've helped you acquire so many amazing emerging artists over the past four or five years. Something I think like so, that. yeah. yeah. Uh, can you tell us about the Harbor Museum and what your mission is. Sure. And sure. Oh. why you chose Detroit. So Detroit, let's start with Detroit. Yeah. So Detroit to me is one of the most amazing, brilliant, beautiful cities. And if you ever think how policy actually impacts future, think about the fact that the state of Michigan used to have a media credit, much like Georgia has, and you've seen the obviously the explosion in Atlanta of, of production. Uh, Louisiana used to have, have, have one very similar. Um, the legislature in Detroit, or, or in Michigan at one point, came in and said they were giving tax breaks to Hollywood liberals. They didn't, you know, they, and, and most of the benefit was actually going to Detroit, and, and they didn't want to see that happen. But I did a number of films in Michigan, small independent films, and I met some of the best people in the world. Detroit is this interesting mashup, and so you know, I still have my place in Brooklyn, but, but Detroit is, is, is this interesting mashup of Legacy of art, creativity, music, whether we're talking about Motown or talking about electronic music, house music, somebody's from Chicago, don't, don't hate on me, but house <laughs> music started in Detroit, let's be fair. <laughs> and so, so you, and then electronic music started in Detroit, and, and, and the, the art scene in Detroit, and the people there are this interesting mashup. My mother's from South Carolina, mm -hmm. and uh, I was born in the Midwest in Iowa, and Detroit has this hard scrabble underbelly, but this sweet southern softness. Mm -hmm. And it has soul. And it's an 87% black city. There's no city like it, but it's going through so many struggles and mm -hmm. issues that I just wanted to pour into the city. And so I, 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 I bought a business there. I own a coffee roastery in Detroit to try to provide jobs. But then I bought the Fisher Mansion, which is one of the most famous homes in Detroit, which mm -hmm. is um, it's like Detroit's White House in a way, right? Yeah. And it's been restoring it since 2016. And that's going to be the home, and that is the home of the museum. Um, we haven't officially opened yet, but we've been keeping it kind of quiet and couldn't be more excited about what it's going to be. Because it's going to be way. about, it's in a neighborhood, and it's about welcoming folks. There's been too many times uh, museum-style institutions have acquired our art, but kind of never made us feel welcome. Mm -hmm. It has an antiseptic vibe. And, and so therefore, the way we actually experience the work is modified by them, rather than actually presenting the work in a very comfortable environment where you know you're welcome to be you. The music that's there is pumping in a way that, that helps support the work. All the types of engagements and programming and education and collecting education runs through the space. And you, we can do this. And, 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 and what really inspired it originally is that, you know, I've been collecting for so many years and built up this collection, but knowing that 
90 plus percent of our people don't know who Amy Sherald is, mm -hmm. uh, Simone Bedley, Carrie James Marshall, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Titus Kaffer, Nick Cave, we can go on and on and on and on and on. And we're in an ID economy and we have to understand and particularly our young people have to know that all these people look like their aunties and their cousins, their yeah. uncles, their brothers, and they can create the same work. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about industry, right? Her brother, we always hear about Elon Musk or Steve Jobs or, or any of these so-called great creative entrepreneurs. Her brother has created a trillion dollar industry. He is perhaps the greatest creator of an industry. And if you think about the amount of wealth and money that has just come off, just not as even his original copies that he's inspired, right. it's in the trillions of dollars. And so we can't forget that. Mm -hmm. You know, and we and, and, and so we have to present our own work to our own people. Right. And that's what the museum is about. And, uh, and when you all come to Detroit, I hope it's part of your, your visit. Yes. You go to the Motown yeah. Museum, come over to the Harper. Yeah. You know when do, when do the doors open? Your, the doors are going to open when my board raises enough money. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And the art is on the walls. It's ready to receive the it people. Is. It is. But security costs money. <laughs> Yeah, the programming cost money, and my board needs to show up. Oh, we got wow. you. We, it's coming it's together. It's going to open in 2023. <laughs> okay. Officially. We're really open now for folks to do different things, yeah, small privates. events, mm -hmm. private things. And so just really, the whole thing is, is that we want to dial it in in the right way because it's really about programming. Of course. It's ultimately about how much education can you get in there. What we're going to do is we're going to let people tour within the mansion, mm -hmm. and then the carriage house we're converting to an art space. So we'll have a whole segment where there'll be uh, the opportunity to create digital art and, and, and electronic and all of that, and then hardscape art, canvas, uh, uh, sculpture, et cetera, in another section. And so anybody can do what they want. And we already have a deal with the Detroit Public Schools to allow uh, one classroom a day through, hopefully with COVID. Oh, wow, that's amazing. amazing. That's amazing. So Lisan. What does protecting and preserving the legacy of Jean-Michel look like on a day-to-day -day basis? I think I kind of answered that. It looks like, um, it looks like, like ensuring let's that... Let's just be more specific. Yeah, I know. I'm chunking down. I'm chunking if down. If someone called you and they said, oh, I want to put the crown on a bag, and they just, they don't even call you, they just do it. How do you react to that? See, those are two different things. So right? answer, answer If both. somebody plops a crown on a bag, I, um, our role is to protect the copyrights of Jean-Michel. Our role is to ensure that his work is protected by law and that people respect that. And so if someone were to want to do something um, and if they wanted to use his artwork uh, or an image of his artwork in order to do that, they would come to us and ask us permission. And we have an agent, Artist Star, that we've been working with for t over 25 years. And they have helped us to build that part of the business that is Jean Michel, which is ensuring that his works are licensed, that they go through the appropriate cha channels, and that our rights are protected. Mm -hmm. If someone were to slap a crown on something or, you know, use an artwork, let's say that, um, without our permission, we uh, would ask you to stop. <laughs> Very nicely the first time, Very right? nicely the first time. Maybe. I don't know. It depends on who it is. Yeah. <laughs> and let me say, speaking of that, I brought this because mm. I just want to show this is an example of <laughs> genius, brilliance, and beauty. Look at that. Look at Beautiful leather. I just love this bag so much. And y'all can't get it. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. They're so very much. limited. <laughs> you can't right? do you have to talk to her to get it. Well, but, thank you so for that's, that. That's she, in she the gift shop. I, I, I was going to bring that back. I, I did wanna, not know. Thank that's, you for that. But I, example. Yeah, and I just want to add that, you know, it's, um, it's protecting his legacy, and it's also like protecting the way that he's portrayed. So sometimes right. people like to focus on the tragic story you know, his 
the way that he passed away or, you know, just the, these people like to sensationalize things. Mm -hmm. And our role is also, even when working with institutions or and museums, our, our job is to make sure that he's portrayed in a way that points back to his work, because that's really what matters, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Like it's, we want his life or what we do today to be a celebration of this beautiful black man's life, our brother. And so our role again is to make sure that 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 happens. In the beginning, you know, because he's my brother, I would see people and they'd do works and it would, not copying his work, but just the work that looked like his. And I would feel a way about it. And I would be like, what are they doing? And it has <laughs> taken, me, taken me some time mm -hmm. to really appreciate how it's inspired, fun. you know, to your point, Hill, how much this man has inspired so many, an entire generation of artists, an entire generation of chefs and musicians and vocalists and exactly. rappers. And Desires. I mean, he is just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's overwhelming, overwhelmingly beautiful. Mm. Love it. Can I add one last thing? Yes. Sometimes I hear things from people because I go on to the social medias. <laughs> and I hear people making comments sometimes like, he wouldn't have wanted this or he wouldn't have wanted that. And I think um, it takes money. I think sometimes we feel like the shame in understanding that it does take resources to get things done. And the way that we're able to continue to support Jean Michel is because of the licensing. So we opt to do that right. versus creating a fire sale out of this man's work, mm. Mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it really is about finding ways to really strategically focus on generational wealth. And listen to what she just said. Basically, the ability to help control price and value. So if she starts, put, if they start putting out you work, what does it start to happen? Mm -hmm. starts to Absolutely. Right? Absolutely, and that's true nice. about everything. You know, it's like you don't give everything because then it's out there and you don't have any say over it. Mm. You lose control of your narrative, yeah. which is one of the primary reasons, one of three primary reasons why we chose to create the exhibition or curate the exhibition that we did. It was to control the narrative because without our voice and my sister and I, we're the only generation that can really speak to Jean-Michel's life from the personal perspective that we're able to. Mm. And before us, there were people who maybe were friends and not taking anything away from those relationships, but imagine if a friend of yours that you had during a particular chapter became the voice for your entire life. Yeah. So it wasn't something that we necessarily were jumping at the, chomping at the bit to do. It wasn't like, oh, we just wanna do this. It was like, wait a minute. If not us, who? So I think there's a lesson there about just really holding on to the value of things, just like anything else, you know, when you let it all out there, you lose control of the whole situation. And that's true of anything, you know? Hill, why should collecting art be a strategy for wealth building? There's always a conversation about art and then the commoditization of mm. art and where that falls. And I think that the word that you just used in that question is strategy. You have to have a strategy to be a collector. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll tell you guys an interesting story. Uh, well, you may not find it interesting, but it was interesting to me. Um, I was in, in Cannes in France, and I was being introduced to this really big European collector. And he was like, tell me about your collection. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's how they do that. That's how they that do. is how they do, for real. Right. You know, right. they're very, yeah. and, uh, and so I started telling him, I started talking about it. I was very excited because like, I just love it so much. And he was like, no, no, no. This is a number of years ago. No, 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 Hill. You are doing it all wrong. <laughs> I was like, what do you mean I'm doing it wrong? Uh -huh. And he, he said, you will, you will, you will run out of money, mm -hmm. and you will be poor. 
I love how you got that accent. Yeah, Come on, yeah. This is the actor. I'm stop it. Now. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm like, like into it. it. But, but, but uh, I was like, well, what do you mean? And, and then he goes to break down a couple things. And this was, first, it was a very valuable lesson, and I'm happy that I'm going to share it here. Because actually, I don't, I don't think I've ever shared this story publicly mm, like this. Okay. But it was very valuable, and it, and it impacted my collecting journey to hopefully answer that question. And what it is, is that he said, you must, yes, buy, because I explained to him, I just buy what I love, and, I, and I, I feel it, and I love it. And he says, that's great, but that's unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And he said, first of all, you must always buy two. And I said, buy two? He said, yes. Because what's going to happen over time as you build your collection, there will be some artists that do very well. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is that if you only have one, you'll never want to sell it. And therefore, you can't ever benefit from the monetization of that market. Mm -hmm. And you also won't be able to ever buy back into that artist. And you also won't be able to buy other art because you will have run out of money. And so the reason why you buy two is that you get to a point in your collecting journey, you wait, 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 you collect, 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 you get to a point in your collecting journey where you have to start selling one to buy two more. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. sell one to buy two more. Sell one to buy two more. And then the art collecting begins to sustain itself. Now mm -hmm. this is what's so interesting, and, 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 and I tell you this is true, you never hear about big collectors selling work, right? Because they sell it visa NDA very privately. But I don't care, the wealthiest, biggest collectors you could name me are selling their work. Small little bits here, small little bits there. Mm -hmm. Because they use the sale of that work to, to collect get new more work. work. Mm -hmm. right. And that's ultimately, you get to that point, right? Where you're not using your earnings, right. you're using it. So, so, and you're still supporting the culture. And you're still supporting yeah. art, the culture, and you're money. able to, to, you know, our whole ethos and my whole ethos is always living artists. So that's what I, that's the ethos of the museum. I want to support living artists. I, I you know, listen, much love to Jacob Lawrence. No, I Romare recently. Beard, and I love you too, but that's not what I'm doing. Right. I'm not trying to get into the commodification of dead people's art. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to support artists who are alive right now, mm -hmm. and if I can buy their art, that lets them make more art. Absolutely. And yeah. that is, that's my thing, because I also just like knowing the artist. Knowing One the of my artist. favorite things is a studio visit. I can't have a studio visit with Romare Beard <laughs> until they come out with the hologram. <laughs> and maybe I'll buy his art with the hologram. I don't know, but the point is, I like going to Rashid Johnson's studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like going to Micheline Thompson's, Thomas's studio in Brooklyn. I like going to Ainsley Burroughs Studio in Baltimore. I like going and meeting and talking and yeah. we talk about the work and we talk about what's going on. And then it helps me inform my collecting and it also makes it much more personal. I also love artists that I collect from to write me little notes on the verso. And that makes it special. And like, it's almost like that special thing that no one else ever gets to see. Because right. no one will ever see the back of the work. But I know on the back that this artist said, Hill, you're a really nice guy, or whatever they say, right? And, and so, whatever, but I know that's my own little thing. That's mine. That no one, no one will ever take it off the wall and see it. Right. And so, so, obviously that's what I love. So, if, 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 and I, let me just say this. It's extremely difficult to sell work. Because collecting becomes an addiction. Mm -hmm. It's a real addiction. Mm -hmm. And I'm a, I have an addiction. In fact, I've had friends literally pull me to the side and say, <laughs> dude, you got a problem. <laughs> you have a real problem. This thing, this, you can't do this. Think about your son. Right? <laughs> You're trading his future. What are you doing? And it's okay, though. And, and <laughs> it is. It's totally okay. So, you know, there's not, certainly not enough wall space to display all mm -hmm. the work. 
and you have to get big storage facilities and store it in safe places with proper climate control. But what number are you at? Probably around 375 works, 400 hours, maybe 425. Depends. I just got an incredible collection. Now, this is where I broke my, my rule, but it was I couldn't pass it up. 82 works of Purvis Young. Mm -hmm. Now, Purvis Young mm -hmm. um, <laughs> dies. <laughs> Purvis Young uh, uh, passed. He's from Miami, passed of AIDS. Just so inspirational to me because this goes to the point around how they tried to commodify, uh, categorize our work to decrease our values. Mm -hmm. They'll call us folk artists or street mm -hmm. artists mm -hmm. and stuff. They'll use words mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than fine artists. Right. right? Absolutely. And, and, and as soon as you label someone that, it automatically it discounts right. their value. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they did that to purpose. He was making beautiful work, powerful work, found object work, incredible stuff. But that there was this massive collection of work of his on paper that was being sold as a group Mm. And so, got it. Yeah, I told Pierce, my son, he had to start working <laughs> <laughs> to help he you said, with your addiction. Six. Yeah, he's like, I that's said, right. we gonna get some purpose. <laughs> 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 have to start mulling some. Figure it out. That's right. Oh my God. Every fifty cents counts. Every fifty cents. Counts. There you go. <laughs> but I remain buying two. Just remember that, and it's hard at first, but 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 buying two of an artist's work, number one, supports them more. And number two, um, allows you flexibility in the future. Yeah. You always buy two. I always, I yeah. always buy two. Not always. always at the same time. Though. I'm just saying you do. I know you, have you an do. Intent. <laughs> you have an intent with an artist. So maybe you can't afford to buy two at that time. Mm -hmm. But you purchase a work and then you, oh, another work becomes available at some point. You buy another work from that same artist. That's, that's the idea. And two, that's just the mint. You want to do more right. than two. That's, you, you, know, you want to do more. What I like and appreciate about that is that it really is about supporting other artists and finding a way to support the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and sometimes it's through buying multiple works of theirs. Sometimes it's, you know, giving them tips and telling them how to make a business out of this thing, how to make a living doing the work that they're doing or connecting them to other people. So I really like that idea. There's a part of me that's like, what do you mean only living artists? You know, but I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're doing right. I, I think we're doing, doing okay. <laughs> but I love the story of an artist. I actually agree with you. I love meeting an artist and hearing their journey and hearing, you know, what their, you know, what they were thinking or what's happened in their life and what's, what's informing the direction that their art is taking. And let me be clear. The living artist piece is for the museum. Mm -hmm. I have personal desires. Like, I, we just talked about it. I purchased a Basquiat because I needed to have it, because I wanted him in my life. But that's not going to go into the museum, because yeah. the museum is not for that. It's right. going to go into my, my, like my house and be with me. But mm -hmm. I love that mission because I think that you want to see your life and your work and the experience of people viewing your work through the eyes of people that love you. And so the fact that you're able to and have chosen to partner up and to create a board and to create this space where living artists can be showcased is an amazing thing for them because they need to know that there are places and walls where their work is welcome. Yes. And where they're not going to be devalued with those the words. I'm a master practitioner of NLP, so words matter. So in some of the work that my sister and I do around checking, you know, reading through us, sometimes it's like, you know, curators can be wordy. It's like, you know, 300 page essays or whatever. Uh, that's a lot, but you know what I mean? Going through it and seeing those little words like street artist or, you know, he, you know, came from the ashes of, you know, whatever, the street life or whatever those things are. So you those are going through words, essays. Yes. I love that. Those little words matter Absolutely. because those things become the document that tells the story of a person's life. And it's really important to us that that young person 
when they're reading about Jean Michel, that they're reading the story as accurately and truthfully um, a story as they possibly can, right? And we can't hit every single piece of it, and we weren't around him every single minute of every day. But our role, and I think the role of all of us within our family, is to make sure that truth is in the story, you know? So I'm going to jump right into that because it, it's, um, it's relative. Can you tell us what it was like, just quickly, mm -hmm. growing up with Jean-Michel, and what was it, do you think, that was about his work, that his mind, that influenced his work? Oh, wow. Um, Jean-Michel was busy <laughs> all the time. He was super creative. He was really mischievous. Mm -hmm. And he came up with these really elaborate plans and you know things that he would engage Janine and I in, and we'd be you know, in there doing the thing. He was also very generous, a very protective brother, very loving, very intense at times, um, a really direct communicator, like you knew where you stood at all times, which I really respect about him. And, um, and he was really fascinating to watch. And in some ways, he was just my brother. Like, you, you know, it wasn't, and I, I've said this before, but people sometimes imagine that he was like walking around with like a beret, speaking with a French accent, and you know, <laughs> that's not what was happening. He was just like living his life and documenting it through art or sketchbooks and journals and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, it was, uh, Jean-Michel was, uh, he was love, he was love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get that, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. All right, so we are towards the end of this. Sadly, because I have so many more questions, but um, I want to give you guys an opportunity to engage and ask maybe, what time is it? Does anyone? Uh, 7.09. So probably a good four or five. And you can just speak loudly can because um, we're, it's mic'd up in here, so. I want to call on, uh, my goddaughter Issa is in the yeah. back to ask a question. Oh! <laughs> Issa Hi. Eden, one of the most talented <laughs> actresses in Los Angeles. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> Do you have a question, Issa? <laughs> we'll take that. <laughs> so cute. Oh man. I think she had a question. Mm -hmm. Um Wow. This talk was amazing. So grateful to be here right now. Um, my question is for you, um, and I want to mispronounce your name. Lisan. Lisan. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I was lucky enough, I was exposed to Basquiat as a kid, and I really, really loved him. I've seen the documentaries, the film, read countless articles. Um, there was never a mention of him being a brother. I know. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. And I think that just really made me love him so much more. Like the fact that it never came up. Wow. It's the girlfriend, it's Madonna. And uh, why? Because I think that the story of a, um, a black kid from the street who had nobody, who um, was on his own, you know, who was a wild child is a story that uh, people felt was a better story for them to tell, you know? That's why it's so important to own your own story, mm. you know? Because this was a person who um, loved music. Who would have known that about him, right? Mm. He was an artist, uh, he was a, um, you know, a painter and a, um, and drew and a, po a poet in a lot of ways, but he also walked the runway in Paris for Comme des Garçons. You know, he was a foodie, a foodie like you would, like he made foodie before, f he had us like doing fondue at home in Borum Hill before, you know, way, way back. So I don't know why, I can't answer that question. I, th I think there's a lesson in there and the lesson is to own your own narrative and to make sure that you, if there's a story you need to tell, or if there's a way that you want the world to see and experience you, recognize and take accountability for that. Mm -hmm. But I don't know why. 
Yeah. You know, I think part of it also, I'm sorry, is that people speak what they know. So if I, you know, I can only speak to the experience that I'm having sitting here next to Hill and Mashanda today, right? So that's all I have. So in the absence of his family coming forward and saying, okay, this is the son of a Puerto Rican woman and a Haitian man who immigrated to this country at X age and a father who left Haiti because of political unrest and we grew up in Borum Hill and yada, 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 yada. In the absence of that story being told, there's really nothing for people to know except what they've been exposed to. So for us, there's, there is an accountability for us, you know, and people have been asking us about Jean Michel, like who is this person for years? My dad's super private, he wanted no part of that. For mm -hmm. him, it was about putting his head down, doing the work, making sure his son was respected, making sure that his son's, the value of his work, you know, was retained and, um, and amplified. And that, I think that onus is actually on us. Absolutely. And, and, and that's why the collecting journey is so important. That's why there's all, all sorts of things. Interesting thing, there was, I got wind of this footage that existed about your brother. And I wanted to do, she goes, no, listen. You're you full of surprises. What else do you have? So <laughs> I got wind of this footage that you just about a brother. It was, it, was, it was one of his last trips. He took a trip to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And I'm part owner of a hotel in New Orleans. I'm in, and then there was this talk about this footage of him, like super eight footage of when he went to New Orleans for the first time and, and the last time. Wow. And... So I had worked with the director. He wouldn't, I don't think he'd want me to share his name, so I'll respect that. But I, I, I worked, had worked with the person who had shot the footage. So I said, can we meet? I'd like to talk about this footage and how important it is and how we could, you know, really do a project. And he said, he showed me the footage on his computer. And I was like, oh. I said, we have to do so. I said, no, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I've been holding on it for 30 plus wow. blah, 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 years. I don't know what I want to do with this. And it reminds me of the same piece of story around how they can label a street artist or folk artist. You know, I was working on a documentary about Thornton Dial. Um, and, and if you take Thornton Dial and look at his work, Southern artist, tiny, 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 tiny town in Alabama. I fortunately got to spend time with him and go to his house and meet with him before he passed away. You look at Rauschenberg, there's no question he copied Thornton Dial. You look at de Kooning, no question he copied Thornton Dial, mm. right? No question, but Thornton Dial was a folk artist. You mm. know, it's from tiny little nowhere in Alabama, but then you have Rauschenberg and de Kooning are in the Met. And they're copying him, you know? And so we have to control that, y'all. We have to collect the work. Mm -hmm. We have to tell the stories. We have to do the documentaries. We have to do all of the work to tell our stories and hold our stories dear and not let them just buy up all our art, put it into storage, and then have it pop up at Christie's and stuff. Exactly. Films, 10 years later, where they're making money and they're actually determining what's actually happening in the market for the work. We have to create our own ecosystem. Yeah. Exchange, trading, purchasing, et cetera. It's on us to do that. And our art is just as much a documentation of our life experience through the chapters that these artists lived as anything else. Mm -hmm. It's storytelling, you know, it, it really is. And I think that if we, you know, you, you look today and you look at these different artists and, you know, my heroes are women or the, the um, painting of George Floyd mm -hmm. over on the other side. Like it is the documentation of a point in time. My brother's art, one of the reasons that he's so relevant is because his message is so relevant. You look at Jean-Michel's art today or you look at some of his words and it's pro they're prophetic. You know, the same things that he was talking about, capitalism, 
racism, socialism, you know, all the isms. He was talking about that 35 years ago. And unfortunately, a lot of those things we are still dealing with today. So for me, when I purchase art, I see it as a stamp for the time. You know, this artist is expressing, you know, the, you know, the, the, the experience for a woman, you know, what that looks like, what it looks like to be behind black skin mm -hmm. as a woman, what it looks like to be behind, you know, a female body and the ways that we interact with the world, what it looks like for a man, a black man, you know, to be in this world, a Latino man. Uh, so I think it really is, you know, you're buying a piece of the story. And you, you know? can find all of that in all these unsuspecting places. Right. Go to the little tiny art fairs. Go to the book fairs. Mm -hmm. there was a, I went to this one book fair. It was actually here in LA many years ago. And I saw this black and white picture of Michael Jackson. And it must have been the latest picture before he had any work done that I'd ever seen. And right. I was like, I told the guy, could I buy that photo? I would want that. Photo? And he was like, no, I'm only selling it in collection. Yeah. I said, well, what's the collection? Yeah. He said, well, I own the entire collection of, uh, of Rock Scene Magazine. Mm -hmm. I was like, what the fuck is Rock Scene Magazine? <laughs> he said, oh, it was, a, it was a scene. He said, you remember Tiger Beat and these, these types of fanzine things? He said it was a five-year in New York City documenting punk rock in one place in particular, and you'll know this place, called Max's Kansas City. Mm. I was like, what's Max's Kansas City? Now, if you ever go to New York, you're on Park Avenue at 19th Street, and there's a little deli that says Max's with two X's deli next to the W Union Square. That's where Max's Kansas City was. But Max's Kansas City was this legendary punk rock place led by Lou Reed and Patti Smith mm -hmm. where Jean-Michel Basquiat would go, mm -hmm. Andy Warhol would go, because Andy Warhol's studio was right around the corner. And then you have all like the original cast of Saturday Night Live, John Belushi, you know, Gilda Radner and all that. They would go to Max Kansas City and see this music. This is right before the Mud Club on White Street that her brother made really popular, uh, you know, popped up. White Street was further downtown into Soho. And so, so I go, he says, if you want to see the whole collection, I, of course, I, as you know, I'm an addict. So I was like, oh, oh yeah, I want to see, I want to see. So he says, well, meet me. This is how this weird art stuff works. He says, meet me at my bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel. <laughs> he's like, I didn't bring all that tear to the fair. It's in my hotel. And I was like, OK, so I go. And I see him slip something in my drink, but I didn't think anything else. <laughs> And so I go to his hotel room. He's in a bungalow at Beverly Hills Hotel. And I, he pulls out this case. And it's all these black and white photos. Mm -hmm. Jean-Michel, Andy Warhol, Lou Reed, Patti Smith, all of the punk rock, the whole thing. And it was just incredible. People in drag. This, this, it, was, it was like a capture of time. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with what I'm trying to do with the museum and nothing to do with anything, but it was so fascinating to me that whoever these photographers were that captured this five-year window in New York City, which arguably is probably the greatest creativity window oh, yeah, in absolutely. the history of the world, because hip-hop started That's then, right. it was a, a punk rock time. started then, That's right. you had incredible artists, right. Maplethorpe, Basquiat, Grace Jones, Grace jo it was all just of it. Studio 54. It was a, it was a vibe, was this, yeah. for sure. Whatever was going on in New York. In I that, wish I was old enough to be in those It was the water. Streets. I think 70, it was something in the water. 76 to 82, that yeah. kind of window. Yeah. Whatever was happening, I don't know what, but it was something special. So I ended up with this collection just because I went to this tiny little book fair. Wow. Right? And that's... So we gotta follow the crumbs, right? It's all, it's all these little breadcrumbs that'll lead you in your journey mm. and, and why it's important for us to do that. I agree. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Mark? What's up, what's up? My question could uh, probably apply for all three of you if you wanna answer. Um, is there one, could be several, but one piece that you can think of in your collection that gutted you, that like really, really made you feel a profound like anger or happiness or sadness? I can answer like that first. 
Can I answer that first? Yeah. So I could, I'd have a different answer. You know, if you ask me the same question 10 minutes from now, I may have a different answer. But um, 2020, I spent a lot of 2020 down in San Diego. And um, San Diego is, it lacks diversity. I'll just say that. It really does. And it's all good, because I love it. I'm there. I'm just going to bring us all together. But it lacks diversity. And so I was there, and I um, was in the throes of all the things that were happening during 2020. And I had uh, purchased a work from Ainsley Burroughs. Uh, Ainsley Burroughs. He's also the founder of The Sweet Spot, which is a, uh, okay, y'all know. Y'all know, it's, it's, uh, it's fresh and beautiful and fun. Um, uh, Ainsley Burroughs, A-I-N-S-L-E-Y-B-U-R-R-O-W-S. Incredible. Incredible. So Ainsley, um, I asked, he had this collection of works that he did, like over 100. And he's like, I'm never selling them. And I'm like, man, you got to sell something. He's like, I'm never selling them. I'm like, whatever. So The Maroon series? No, yes. The Maroon So I have a work called Ancestors Rising. And he parted with it because I said, Ainsley, I'm out here in San Diego, and I need some black people around me. And if I'm stuck up in here and we all know what we're doing, we're not leaving the house very much, I want, I need that. I need it. And so he sold it to me. And it is a huge work. It's like an eight-foot work. Mm. And um, he shipped it to San Diego. And it was getting, it was supposed to be stretched. And these suckers took so long to stretch my work. And I'm like, what are you all doing? I want, you know. And the guy's like, I'm so sorry. But every time someone came in to my shop, they wanted to know, they felt the energy of this work. And they wanted to know what it was about. And the name of it is Ancestors Rising. And it sat behind my couch for, I've since changed it, but it sat there for two years. Mm. Um, and I, just as a way of reminding me that I'm not by myself and that I stand at the door of all the ancestors behind me, including my brother, my daddy, and my mama, and all of us, that I stand at the door of all of my ancestors. Love that. So a bunch of years ago, I get introduced to Ainsley. As you said, I get emotional to thinking about this now. He and his beautiful wife lived in this place out near Kennedy Airport. Canarsie. And so went out to, he's like, he'll come on out. I walk in and it was so welcoming. They made like a little cheese thing. And we go into the, the you know, they're kind of downstairs area. And there's just all oh, this work mm -hmm. folded up, rolled up, mm -hmm. and he starts Lined. and he starts unrolling stuff. And he works big format, large work. And I was like, Whoa. and he's talking about the different series and the different work. And I was like, same type of thing. You have a a, a, a reaction, but he talks about the history of people who fought back against slavers mm -hmm. and who these people were, and he's just brilliant. And we've developed such a close relationship now that we talk about work and even talk about inspiring and pushing. Like I try to push, like Ainsley, go for it. Like, cause that's part of it. And we all want to be in relationship right. with people who we trust enough to work with, you know, and all this. And so there's no question we're going to do a big, Ainsley Burroughs exhibit in the Harper at some point. He okay. said it. We're going to do it. Gonna, so I'm going to go buy my dress. You know, get <laughs> ready. Dress. Okay, board, get and, the money together so we can have. <laughs> but, but that, to me, to answer your question, you get moved by so many things. One yeah. thing, I, there's a Micheline Thomas work that I have that didn't move me because it was like gutted me. It moved me because of the level of detail. Mm -hmm. It was, mm -hmm. it's, it, and, and, I, and it also moved me because the only, only reason I was able to collect it is because Micheline called the gallery. And this is another thing, because this is why it's really important to have a relationship with artists. Mm -hmm. Some of the best art you'll never see That's because right. they'll call their white collectors first. That's right. Let's be real. Unless the artist understands that they don't work for the gallery, the gallery works for them. That's right. They can call. They can call mm -hmm. the gallery and say, I need this person to move up to the top of the list for my next Absolutely. show, That's my right. next exhibit, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's right. And she is the one. 
they got me access to that work. Mm. But for her, calling them, I never would have been able to get it. But it's so beautiful and so detailed. And then you can follow, like I said, follow the crumbs. I don't know the artist's name, excuse me, I'm sorry. But in the other room, if you could look on that back wall, beautiful little work, completely inspired by Nicolini. No mm -hmm. question about it. But that's beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Because that work is lovely. But, but there's no question that, that whatever Micheline was doing, that art, what's, what's the art? Chantel. Chantel. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whatever Micheline was doing, Chantel yep. picked up on it and said, this reflects my spirit and what I want to create art mm -hmm. this way. And so if you're not in a position to get a Micheline, get a Chantel. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? Because it's the, it's, it's, it's the breadcrumb. It's, it's the extension of what that, of what her work does and has created, just like, I mean, there's no comparison of anyone in history to that breadcrumb piece with her brother. Absolutely not. No comparison. But all art inspires it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, do you want me to answer as well? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the, one of the pieces that really hit home for me is um, my Ernie Barnes. And it was, a lot of it has to do with the fact that when I met him, he offered to just bring work to the house and have us pick. Hmm. So he came with his wife and um, this was probably about 2007. He came with his wife and he probably brought 20 works and just laid them around the living room. And there was this one piece that I wanted for myself. I have pictures of this too. It's a woman from the back and she's in a dancing moment. Mm. And it just reminded me of every woman in my West Indian family. Mm. So it would probably be that. Wow. And it hangs on the side of my bed. guys so much this was so good i wish we had more time because there's so many more questions but i want to end with just thanking both of you for being a part of this you know my mission is to create opportunities for education for the community mm -hmm. so i feel like this room is very community based i know most of you this curation of people was very intentional um and thank you Thank you so much, Thank Michelle. You. This is this amazing, is... beautiful. We need this. <laughs> Absolutely. We need, and the artists, these yeah. artists need this. Thank you. Yeah. Do you guys want to share your socials or let them know when the us. show closes in New York? <laughs> they will. Just go to Michelle. Go to Michelle. Michelle. Michelle's page. You'll find us. When does um, King Basquiat close in New York? Uh, we have tickets on sale through the end of October. If you guys haven't seen the show, and I'm glad I still got you. Everyone always asks me, is that stuff real? What? Are those works real? Because they're huge. They're some of the biggest works that I've ever seen of his. Mm -hmm. And they want to know if like, the artifacts are real. I'm like, yeah. So now so it's your chance to clear it up. Has anyone seen the show? Is anyone here? Whoa, thank you so much. Thank you. 95% uh, of what is in that exhibition in those spaces is actual, I mean, all of the work is real, first of all. Let's just clear that up. And then the, even the dining room table that was ours, that dining room, the way that kitchen is set up, that is our kitchen. Mm -hmm. Most of what's in there, obviously the wallpaper we had recreated, the upholstery on the couch we had recreated, that little white table, ours. So 95% of what is in that exhibition is actual ephemera artifacts. My brother's china set is what you see, it's his. Mm. Um, the things in the studio, everything but the cigarette butts, because we didn't save that, obviously, <laughs> and uh, the wine bottles. But we did reach out to a couple of his friends to find out what kind of wine they were drinking back then. Mm. You know, mm. so every, it is the goal was to provide a real, authentic view into Jean Michel's life. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. awesome. Thank you.